Uh, I've been holding a lot of presentations on my perspective of Africa, my experiences of Africa. Um, for the research, I visited six countries. By now, I've visited 13 countries in Africa. And in a lot of these discussions, I feel that the mental mindset of the people I talk to looks something like this. It is uh, rural, it is dry, it is poor, it is difficult, um, and people slot the information that I give them into this mindset. Now, and this is the mindset that at the same time when I'm holding these talks is in the back of my head. So we do have a difficulty. This is the skyline of Nairobi um, with its beautiful greenery. And this is in, in, in my head, and so we often have a misunderstanding. Finally, as soon as I switch to the subject of technology in Africa, people don't think about this. People think about that. So there's this very traditional mindset, and then the mobile phone comes in, and somehow it is eased very nicely into all the stereotypes about Africa. You will find that about two-thirds of all articles about mobile phones in Africa are illustrated with either a Zulu, a Dogon, or a Maasai in the savannah with a mobile phone. <laughs> and um, write to any journalist who ever does that to stop doing it. Um, it's, it's, it's a terrible uh, mishap. Now, here is what happened over the past few years. The red line is the population of Africa nearing one billion by some estimates, and the number of mobile phones in Africa also nearing a billion, and both of them going uh, to two billion in the foreseeable future. Now, this means that a lot of people have mobile phones right now. And this means that literally almost everybody has access to someone who's got a mobile phone. Um, we did research a few years ago when um, SIM card sharing was still widely spread because not everybody had a mobile phone, but everybody had a SIM card. Um, now, like in the West, the mobile phone has become something very private and you don't share a SIM card with anyone anymore. It's your own thing. Um, the other thing that happened is this. Does anyone know what this is? So this is my finger, and it, it truly is. Um, and this is a piece of the Seacom cable. This is what connects continents. When they say three pairs of fiber connecting Mombasa to India or to Europe, then this is it. This is the whole thing that a whole country's bandwidth goes through. Um, and I had one gigabit upload raids that day. I had lots of interviews. This is the day after the day was connected. I didn't bring my scissors to disconnect the continent. Um, <laughs> But I could have in 2009 because there was hardly any cable. What you see on the left is the map the day before that cable was connected. You in South Africa might remember that there was a fiber connection to the rest of the continent, but it was tiny. And now you can see the bandwidth has exploded. Now, this is all the technical stuff, and it means that the cost of connectivity in Nairobi, for example, has dropped by 98%. Um, so that's really lovely. But what it means really is that um, you have, let me start with Nigeria. You, you, many of you know that Nigeria is now officially Africa's largest economy. Um, they revised their GDP upwards by 89%. And a huge chunk of this upwards revision is by including sectors of the economy in the GDP that were not previously included. And one of the biggest ones they included was telecommunications. In their GDP, up to then, only landlines were included, and now they include the whole mobile economy. And that is what made Nigeria a bigger economy than South Africa. And I can tell you the new numbers are better than the old ones. There's no magic going on there. This is real stuff. The other thing that you see is that you see these startups, incubators, very photogenic, and all across Africa. There are more, more than 100 uh, startup centers and incubators for tech right now in Africa, ranging from iHub in Nairobi, which was uh, leading in, in the same building as iHub. You also have NILAB, M-Labs up the road. You have 88 miles per hour. You have active spaces in Cameroon. You have ICE Addis in uh, Ethiopia. You have some in Kigali. You have some MEST in Ghana. You have the co-creation hub in Nigeria. They're literally everywhere, and they're churning out tech entrepreneurs at a very high speed. So there's some great stuff going on. Um, the other advantage um, or the other thing that happens right now is that um, the IT economy is more and more connected to the real economy. Um, this is where the real benefit is. This is serving uh, applications in agriculture. It's not about the latest Android app or the latest uh, iPhone stuff or something. This is helping real people who are non-techies. It's not to laptops talking to laptops anymore, but it is real um, technicians talking to other 
um, talking to real entrepreneurs who don't have a clue what a USSD code is, and I don't. Um, the most recent thing we get, which is actually very nice, um, the first pieces of uh, African-made, well, this is as African-made as an Apple is American-made, um, uh, hardware. This is Kenyan-designed, and it brings the Internet to literally everywhere. This is a brick, and um, you should check it out if you want to. But so even hardware is now coming out of Africa. On the downside, there's also quite a bit. Um, on the downside, you can see that technology exacerbates existing developments, at least IT does. And that means that if a society is crooked and corrupt and full of conflict, then the technology facilitates that. And if a society is healthy and has got a good culture of debate, then the technology facilitates that. Um, that means that, for example, authoritarian states um, or any other actors, um, they can map, uh, make a map, Facebook is a wonderful tool, you can make a map of all homosexuals in Uganda or all white farmers in Zimbabwe or all opposition members in Rwanda. Um, you can do terrible things with this same technology. So there's a real, real threat in that IT. Now, I want to move on a little. Um, this obviously is a road, and road networks are being built very quickly. What um, European infrastructure was built to move um, troops very quickly to the front um, in a war, in a conflict. So European infrastructure actually connects different European countries. African infrastructure was built to take resources in the center of a country to the coast as quickly as possible. So you got all these trunk railroads and trunk roads, and as a consequence, trade between African countries is dismal. Now, there is some hope the West African Highway is making real progress, so someday you might actually be able to drive from Cape Town to Dakar, uh, but the section from Cameroon to Dakar is really making some headway. Um, you have a Pan-African Pan Railroad network that is far off, but the East African section of it is really taking shape, connecting Burundi, Rwanda, um, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Kenya. Um, so some stuff is really moving on to facilitate that trade between countries um, rather than just with the rest of the world, which is, I think, um, one of the most important drivers of the scenarios we saw this morning is how much African countries actually um, trade with each other. Here you see the three biggest flight hubs, uh, Addis, Nairobi, and Johannesburg, and they are interesting because they are already starting to build that pan-African infrastructure because it's easier to put in an airline connection from Nairobi to Lagos or Nairobi to Cotonou than it is to put in a road or a railroad. So that's a kind of leading indicator, and a lot of this, obviously, with the current interruption due to health uh, scares, is, is, is taking place. Now, this is something interesting. This is the theoretical total electricity production capacity of several countries divided by its population. So if that line is downward sloping, it basically means that this theoretical production capacity, if everything was up and running, um, is staying constant and the population is growing. So that's why the line is downward sloping. Um, I found that for Kenya, this is the same wattage that the human brain produces. It's 20 to 25 watts. Um, so that's a wonderful analogy. And um, now if we, enter, um, if, you, uh, if we enter South Africa into the graph, then this is the graph. So there's a bit of a gap. Um, Rwanda needs to increase its per capita energy use by about tenfold to reach the level of Ghana. Ghana needs to go another tenfold in order to reach the level of South Africa. That means a factor of 100. And there's no energy future whatsoever that sees a multiplication of that over the next 30 years. And energy infrastructure does take a long time to produce. However, households have got a very different energy future right now than they had even a few years ago. The kerosene lamp is dying out very, very quickly. Solar lamps are taking over, hand-powered lamps are taking over, micro-wind, micro-water, island solutions of renewable energy, um, all this supported by the all-encompassing uh, diesel generator. But there are a million more things that you can do today on 6 or 12 volts, which can easily be generated with very simple means, and for which you do not need 220, 230 volts. Now, the only things that you can't do in a household on this low voltage bit energy getting by is cooking, ironing, and a washing machine. Those are the three things that you cannot do. So if you've got this island solution and somebody plugs in their iron, the whole village is blackout immediately. Um, but I'm sure there are other solutions for that. So, um, and then comes this mid-level of entrepreneurs. We actually found for Kenya that the total um, capacity of the backup generators for the grid network is actually more than twice of the total grid capacity. So there are so many over-dimensioned 
generators there because also people are very proud of them and they think that in the future they're going to grow and they're going to build that other wing for the hotel, so let's just get a big generator here. Um, but so people start to cope with this. Now, what does that mean in terms of technology in its own doesn't make sense, so technology and people does make sense. People through these technologies do get much more exposure to the rest of the world. Um, and people from the rest of the world, because of this technology, are bringing much more knowledge back and sometimes they're bringing themselves back. So returning diaspora in those tech business that is full of returning diaspora, um, they're coming back so you've got a more diversified capacity. You've got a larger elite, you've got a larger and, and a more diversified elite, and I see that literally in everything, whether that's literature or arts or entrepreneurs or academics, there is a new generation of an intellectual elite, and that is literally Pan-African. That is in all countries you will find these people. Now, the funny thing is that Africa has a, a population pyramid that actually deserves the name, which means that it's going to take very few years until the digital natives or whatever they're being exposed to becomes normal for the majority of the population. Now, for Africa, this is going to take a few years, and for Europe, this is going to take a few decades. So these changes happen a lot quicker here, and I'm sure that they will happen quicker than the change in mindsets of many of the observers. I'm sure that many people will only realize what just happened after it has happened. Now, what has all this got to do with we the people? I think there is a unique opportunity here. Um, there are 54 countries that are literally a mouse click away, they are a short flight away, they are a moment of interest away. You just have to engage with them for one moment and they are right here. I'm sure the majority of you have at one point or another been invited by a friend to visit their family in DRC or in Nigeria or in Kenya or in wherever. That is that moment of interest that you can follow. The future for this continent, and the future is two billion people, not one billion, the future is two billion people. The future of this continent depends on, largely, I think, on how Africa is going to deal with its technology and how it is going to implement it, how positively it is going to make it work for itself rather than having the technology work the continent. There are many dystopian futures we can imagine in this and there are many utopian futures we can imagine in this. Now, the real trick is that the positive futures require an engaged, we the people, to work that technology to the benefit of the continent. Thank you very much.